I want to thank you for tuning in to this worship service. Thank you so much for taking the time to dig into God's word with us. Here at Highview, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. And we'd love to invite you to come out to one of our services at one of our campuses. But we'd also love to, for you to check out Highview at highview.org. May you be blessed by our Lord as you dig into his word to know and follow Jesus. be seated. Thank you so much, Grace. I thought it would be a wonderful thing for you to hear a different and much more pleasant voice to hear this beautiful passage of Scripture, this beautiful story in the Gospel of John. This is a powerful picture that we see of the heart of our Lord. A little bit of background in this very well-known passage. It's this. It's taking place on Thursday evening. It is probably just 15 hours before Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m., and this was the evening meal, so it was probably late afternoon to early evening. And the rest of the Gospel of John, like we said last week, nearly half of it is devoted to not only the final week, but so much of it is devoted to these final hours of Jesus's life before he was crucified. They were eating the Passover meal, and then Jesus, in this incredible display of grace and love, changes the entire meaning of the meal, refocuses them on what it means to be a servant. And this is such an interesting passage because Jesus makes two statements that you really can't figure out how to fill in the blank until you realize what is missing and what is coming. I want you to look again at verse, uh, verse 7. Jesus answered him as he's talking about washing their feet. What I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. So Jesus is about to wash their feet, but he's making a statement. You don't understand what I'm doing. You can't figure this all out. And then it's really interesting. Towards the end of our story, he makes another statement in verse 15. He says, For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. You see kind of the paradox here? Jesus says, I'm going to do something. You're not going to understand it. And then at the end, he says, go and do likewise. There are some missing pieces. Something is missing between I'm washing your feet, you won't understand it, and go and do it. There is a missing ingredient. There's something in this mix that Jesus acknowledges the disciples won't fully understand yet, but they will. You know, my wife is an incredible cook. And last week she said, I've got a new recipe. It's fall chili. And uh, she's a wonderful cook. And so I was excited. But then she told me what was in it. And she had taken a couple of different recipes and it included pumpkin puree and chili beans and beef. And I was like, Hmm, that that sounds different. She's a fabulous cook. And then I was really thinking, what makes it fall? What's the ingredient? And she told me it's cinnamon. And she put cinnamon in it. And can I tell you, it is the best chili I have ever eaten. And we will sell the, we'll sell the recipe to you for $9.99, and, and it's so good, we will send our kids to college for the next year on the proceeds. It was like the missing ingredient, fall chili, pumpkin puree, what, how, and then cinnamon, and it was like, oh, it finally makes sense. We have here in this picture of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, this command to go do the same, but this acknowledgement that you're not going to fully understand. And what does Jesus say? You're not going to understand it until afterward. But we know what the afterward is, right? The afterward is the cross. The afterward is what's going to happen 15 hours later when Jesus died on the cross for the disciples, when he died on the cross for us. 
And the missing ingredient that the disciples would soon learn is this, that the cross, what Jesus did, completely transforms why we serve and how we serve. And we have to understand that when we approach this story. Because this story of of Jesus washing the disciples' feet is a story that's embraced by all kinds of people, but for the wrong reasons. This story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet is embraced by liberal Christians. Liberal Christians will take this story and say, see, this is what we should be doing. We should be meeting needs. Forget sharing the gospel. Can quit trying to convert people, just do what Jesus said to do, wash people's feet, serve them. And so for the liberal mindset, this story has been co-opted basically to produce the social gospel, which is no gospel at all, and it just basically takes serving and meeting needs into an end unto itself, that that's all we need to be doing. We also need to clarify what place the cross plays in this story, because not only do liberal Christians embrace this story, but people from even other religions do. People love this story of Jesus because it is such a beautiful picture of love and service. And people even of other religions will say, see, this is a picture of why Jesus is such a good prophet or such a good example for moral living, and they embrace this. But when we take the cross out of it, This becomes nothing more than just Jesus washing the disciples' feet, a a universal expression, they say, of the, the goodness of man. And even in the realm of where some of us live, this story is misunderstood and embraced even by legalistic Christians who have a works-based or fear-based mentality when it comes to living the Christian life. They embrace the story, but they embrace it by saying, I must serve to please God. I don't want to lose my salvation. I need to make up for my sin. I need to find more pleasure from God. And so all of a sudden, in that mindset, serving merely becomes this quid pro quo arrangement with God. God, if I do this for you, will you do this for me? God, if I'll be just faithful to serve enough, will you accept me more? And can I somehow balance the scales? And in this expression, literally, it takes the the joy, the meaning, and the purpose of serving out of our call to serve. But we're going to see today in this passage, as Grace so beautifully read a moment ago, that the reason for, the purpose behind, the goal of serving is completely transformed in light of what Jesus did on the cross. This is the big idea that I want us to take away. We are called to serve out of an overflow of grace not out of an obligation of guilt. We don't serve because we legalistically must. The cross shows us that we serve because we are loved beyond measure. So what I want us to do today is look at this well-known story and answer the question, how does the cross transform everything about our service? Why is the cross the missing ingredient that turns service from something that is just a good moral example or something we do to try to please God and and find his favor to tip the scales in our balance? How does the cross transform that into this beautiful picture that we have here in this story in John 13? Well, first of all, we see this. The cross transforms our service in this way because the cross, what Jesus did for us on the cross, motivates us to serve. And I know this is a big, long point, okay? I'm sorry, but I had to get it all out. The cross motivates us to serve because we have, because we have been transformed by the saving work of Christ through the cross, not in order to earn the saving work of Christ on the cross. Let me say that again. I had the emphasis on every wrong syllable in that, in that sentence. I'm glad I don't communicate for a living. I would be in trouble. 
Let me say that again, because this is foundational. The cross motivates us to serve because we have been transformed by the saving work of Christ through the cross, not in order to earn the saving work of Christ on the cross. And that's vital. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. So Jesus has made this great declaration that he's going to wash the disciples' feet. Verse 6 says he comes to Simon Peter. And let's just read from verse 6 on. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing uh, doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And then listen to what Peter says, verse 8. Verse 8, Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, and this is important, don't miss this, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but don't miss this, but is completely clean. Do you see that? And you, he says to Peter and to the disciples, you are clean, but not every one of you. And of course, he's speaking about Judas. We are motivated to serve, not because we're trying to earn, but because we have been graciously already been given through the the finished work of Jesus on a the cross. We don't serve to gain approval from God. We don't serve and do things to gain acceptance from God, but we serve as an overflow because of the acceptance we have already received. Again, we see that in what Peter's response is. I mean, first of all, we see a great truth here, don't we? That we must be cleansed that we must have a saving encounter with Jesus or we are lost and hopeless. Jesus makes that clear. He has just said, I mean, I have to wash you. And Peter realizes this, and Peter realized obviously very early in this conversation, this wasn't about the washing Because he's not obviously talking about a bath in the physical sense. He's not thinking that Jesus is saying, oh, you need to go and bathe and knock the stink off. No, no. They both understand that Jesus is doing something spiritual. And this picture of being cleansed is a spiritual cleansing. But Jesus makes an important statement. He says, I don't need to wash all of you because you are already clean. Jesus is making a powerful statement that the disciples, other than Judas, were already clean. That they had been saved in essence, not because of works, not because of some external act, but they, as we know, just as everyone who has ever been saved from the beginning of time until the end of time, that they had been saved because of their faith in Jesus. This foot washing that Jesus was doing was in in essence an act of expressing the love that Jesus had already for those that he had saved. It was a visual picture of Jesus' love for them. And it was a visual picture of Jesus saying to them, you go and love likewise. It was a visual picture and a reminder to us that For the Christian, loving and serving other people is not merely an expression of words. It's not theological platitudes. But Christian love is expressed in practical, hands-on, and sacrificial ways. So this is why Jesus is serving in this way. And we can't miss this. Jesus is expressing his love for those who are already in him because he had cleansed them because of their faith and because an act of great love and grace shown to them. And that's why if you and I serve, and I really want to get to the bottom line, the application here. If you and I serve other people, 
If you and I serve in the church, if you and I use our gifts and talents, but we do it to somehow tip the scale in our favor, if we somehow do it because we think we're trying to quid pro quo God to love us more or to accept us more or to get closer or to get cleaner or to do something in our relationship with him, then we're missing the boat. Because this expression of service was an expression to those who are already in Christ. Their identity was that of those who were in Christ. And Jesus giving us this example is, is, is saying this is why we serve as well. It's because we have been transformed by the saving work of Christ, not in order to earn that. This comes down to what I talk about often because really this has been one of the, the key truths in the Gospel of John. We have to understand our identity in Christ before we can do the things of Christ. We've got to understand our identity in Christ before we can live the Christian life with joy and in freedom. The only way we can break the, the, the bindings of legalistic Christianity is to realize our, our identity in Christ and that then everything we do is an expression of the freedom and the grace and the rest that we have in that identity. Don't forget that our standing, our closeness with God, God's favor is not predicated upon our actions and attitudes. God's favor, God's grace is predicated upon our changed nature that we have this new identity in Christ. Be reminded of what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Uh, Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by a single offering he has perfected, this is you and me, for all time those who are being sanctified. That's our identity in Christ. Ephesians 1, 4 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be, and this is what we are, this is who we are, that we are holy and blameless before him. We say this so often, but we have to grasp this. Biblical sanctification has two aspects. It has the aspect of our identity that we are fully sanctified. We are holy. We are perfect. We are righteous because we have that of Jesus in us. And then the other aspect of our sanctification is our actions and our attitudes, which is a work in progress. But we can't mix up the two because if we don't understand our identity in Christ, we will serve, we will do, we'll use our gifts, we'll do things at church, we'll try to help other people because we want to try to just get in better with God. We're going to try to make ourselves a little bit more holy, a little bit better, a little bit more sanctified. And guess what? We'll always fall short. And so we're reminded with all of this to simply say, and my encouragement to you is if you are serving the Lord, whatever it is, serving others, serving in the church, if you're serving the Lord out of an effort for Him to accept you more, for Him to be more pleased with you, to tip the scales in your favor, then you are missing the reason we serve. And not only are you missing the reason, but you are missing the joy and the freedom. Because I can promise you, I've been there, if you are constantly trying to put more weight on the scale in your favor, it doesn't take very long to realize we can never outweigh the holiness, the perfection, and the goodness of God. And therefore, service becomes a chore. Service becomes a, a reason that we feel under condemnation. We never measure up. What will we do? And we've missed the point of what Jesus did for us on the cross and what he's showing us through the washing of the disciples' feet. So how does the cross transform our service? 
Well, number one, it transforms us because the cross motivates us to serve because of what Jesus has done, not in order to earn what Jesus has done. But secondly, we see this. The second way the cross transforms our service is this. The cross motivates us to serve. Why? So that we would then reflect the gift of grace that we've been given. So when we're not trying to earn, earn, earn by doing, we can then be freed up and have the joy of then saying, oh no, I'm not trying to get, I'm not trying to earn. Now I'm reflecting. I'm sharing. The overflow of this grace is why I serve. So because of the cross, really our service is, again, a reflection of the gift of grace that we've been given. I want to look at this story again and look at verses 13 through 16. I can't think of a more vivid picture or definition of what grace is than Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And just listen to this story again, starting in verse 13. He says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. And then verse 16, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So I think this is a picture of the grace shown to us that we in turn show as an overflow. Now, let's not assume everybody knows what grace is. We throw that word a lot, right? Around a lot, right? So what is grace? Well, grace is God's unmerited or unearned favor. Another great definition of grace is grace is God giving us something we don't deserve. And think about what Jesus did in washing the disciples' feet and what that represented. He's just given one of the most powerful pictures of the grace of God. Think about it, starting in in verse 13. It starts with an acknowledgement that Jesus is, and again, just just look at verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord. And what does Jesus say? He says, and you are right. And so Jesus is acknowledging that he is exalted. I mean, this is another way of identifying himself as God. You can't have grace until you receive something from someone who uh, is greater and higher and exalted. If I do something nice for you, don't call it grace. Because I'm a wretched, wretched man. You're a wretched, wretched person as well. And when we love each other, I mean, it's kind of an expression of grace, but it's not the ultimate expression of grace because, uh, you know, it's not like I'm doing something completely undeserved. I'm so high and mighty that what I'm doing is such an act of unmerited favor. No, 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 no. Never think that. But when Jesus gets down and washes his, the disciples' feet and it's an act of service, he's acknowledging, I, I am Lord, I am teacher. And so we see this picture of the fact that grace is something we deserve from someone so much higher and greater and exalted than us. And then even look at verse 14. In verse 14, he says, I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. And so here we see this idea, this washing of feet as an expression of love, humility, and sacrifice. I mean, this is an overwhelming picture of Jesus, the Creator, literally getting down, had to have been on his hands and knees because they were reclining at a table. That's how they were eating. And you have Jesus taking his outer garment off, and he would have literally had to have gotten down on his hands and knees to wash their feet. And even more than that, this act of grace and love is seen in the fact that he did indeed wash Judas's feet. We can't wrap our minds around that. And again, we further see this is such a picture of grace because, again, what does he say in verse 16? He says, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master. A reminder again that he is master and we are only servants, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent them. And he's just acknowledging again that he is the master. 
We are the servants, yet the master gets on his knees and washes the feet of the disciples. So what does this mean to us? Well, this is a reminder to us that when we serve others, we do it as an opportunity to reflect and communicate that grace that we've been given. We're not earning We're not tipping the scale. We are reflecting as Jesus is showing us his great grace and love. And this transforms people's lives. This is what changes people's lives. Think about what Jesus is going to say in just a few verses in John 13, 34 through 35. He's going to say, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. And this loving one another is wrapped up in this picture of serving one another. And he says, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And then look at verse 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so the cross transforms our service because it reminds us that our serving of other people is merely a reflection and an overflow of the grace that we've been shown. But finally, we see this. How does the cross transform our service? Well, number three, we see this, that the cross motivates us to serve so that we would be blessed. So that we would be blessed. Again, look at verse 17. What a statement. If you know these things, what's he talking about? Everything that he's talked about, he's saying, if you see my example and if you know these things, and the idea is as you come to know them after the, my death, after my uh, resurrection, after my ascension, after the Holy Spirit comes and fills you, all of these things are in mind. He says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. What a simple, powerful statement. You serve not to earn But because you have been given, if you serve as an overflow of grace, then he says you will be blessed. And why will we be blessed? Because serving the Lord is what we were made to do. It is in our spiritual DNA. That is our purpose and calling in life. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, this is not to be taken, this idea that we will be blessed, again, as kind of some word of faith, prosperity, gospel idea. If I do this for God, He'll bless us financially, materially. He's going to bless me physically. Don't miss this. The blessing is the serving. The blessing and the gift is that we are used by God to reflect His grace and His love. The blessedness, the blessing is the life of service. It's the blessing of being used by God, representing God, expressing the overflow of grace and love. That's the blessing. And I think perhaps the greatest blessing is that when we serve others in this way, we are a part of God's redemptive plan. Go down to verse 20. That's really not in our passage today. But listen to how Jesus kind of wraps up this section. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. You see what he's saying? Jesus is making a powerful statement. As we go and serve and reflect the grace of God, people will see Christ in us. And as they receive us, they will receive Jesus. It's a reminder that we are on mission to be living, talking, walking reflections of Jesus and His grace. And when we love other people, when we extend grace, when we share the gospel, when we serve people, not just to serve them, like the social gospel says, but when we serve them to reflect the love and grace that Jesus has, then what happens? People receive Christ because they receive the reflection of Christ in us. And what a beautiful picture. Jesus says, and if they receive me, they receive the one who sent me. Of course,
or speaking of the Father. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making His appeal through us. So how do we apply this? Well, I want to wrap all of this up with an encouragement to you because Jesus did say, here's my example, go and do likewise. And we have the benefit of looking back 2,000 years later at the cross, the resurrection, his ascension, the Holy Spirit coming, the fact that we are filled and empowered and enabled to do this. So what is the encouragement? How do we apply this message? Because we have connected the dots. The disciples hadn't yet, but we've connected the dots. Well, number one, I would say this. Let's embrace, first and foremost, a life of service serve. And I would just challenge you to to ask yourself the question, am I using my gifts and my talents to serve and bless other people? And I want to encourage you with this. Some of the most effective, life-changing acts of service aren't necessarily those done on a grand scale with grand gestures. Some of the most powerful ways you can serve are through small, everyday opportunities to reflect the grace and love of Christ in the lives of people around you. And can I also encourage you that your number one mission field is your family. For some of you, your number one mission field in this season of life is your dorm mate or your suite mate, your classmate. For some of you right now, your primary mission field are your co-workers and and your neighbors. I just want to to tell you, sometimes the most life-changing acts of service come when, when you and I realize that whatever we do, however we live our life, it is literally Christ being lived through us. This commission to go from uh, the Gospel of Matthew to go and make disciples, literally says, as we know, as you are going. And why can Jesus' command to make disciples be as you are going? Why doesn't he say, go somewhere else? Because as Christians, what have we been talking about? Our lives are an act of worship. Everything we do is Christ being lived through us. And so it means that when you serve that person at work, I mean this, it is as significant to the kingdom of God and following and obeying this command as if you would go to Africa to serve. And if God is calling you to go to Africa, go! But my point is, as you are going, because we are, by definition, living, breathing, walking, talking expressions of Christ, it means that when you serve and reflect the grace of God to your family, to your difficult child, to your difficult co-worker, to your difficult sweet mate and roommate, I've been there, I know, you are embracing this life of service And it is just as important a mission field as anywhere you can go. So I would encourage you to look at your hobbies, your work, what you do for fun, your family, uh, your school. I would encourage you to say, Lord, open my eyes and show me how I can serve. And don't forget church. Church is a wonderful place to serve as well. But I do want to say this, that sometimes we fall into two ditches. The only way I can serve God effectively is on the mission field in another continent or only through what the church is doing. And I I want you to serve through the ministries of the church. But can I tell you, I've said this to so many of you, the only thing that keeps me up at night about Highview Baptist Church Beachwood is I am looking at a group of people who are all here because you want to serve. You have a heart to serve. You want to be used by God. And I'll be honest, as we continue to grow, there are going to be not as many opportunities to do that formally through church ministries and programs. But as we grow, those will expand as well. But I want to encourage you, it doesn't have to be through church. Both of those extremes, the mission field or only through church, misses the point, again, that we are living, walking expressions of Christ. So find a place to serve at church. 
But if you don't find it right now, find a place to serve at school, at work, but serve. Secondly, and very quickly, how do we apply this passage? Well, number two, I would encourage us to embrace a life of humility. What an absolute beautiful picture of the humility of Jesus. And I think the best way to apply this is in this way. To see our lives as as tools to express God's grace and love to whoever God puts in our path, no matter their background, no matter how different they are from us, that we should have a humble heart of service that says there is no one that I would not serve. There is no one whose feet I would not wash spiritually. We can't miss the picture that Jesus washed Judas's feet. And we are called to wash the feet of difficult people, of people who have different viewpoints than we have, people who have different political agendas than we have, people who come from a different socioeconomic class, people who have different views of life and what's right and wrong. We have a calling in humility to wash their feet. And then finally, how do we apply this? I would encourage you, number three, embrace living by grace so you can serve as an overflow of grace. The reason why I just feel so led week after week to to harp on and remind us of our identity in Christ is if we are not settled in our identity, if we don't live by grace, if we don't have freedom in how God has accepted us through Christ. And if we don't have a rest in that, and if we don't have an assurance in that, then we will never serve with joy and we'll never serve with freedom. And what we do for Christ will always be just one more chunk of rock to put on that scale that will never balance out. But if we'll embrace our identity in Christ that we are accepted and loved. And if we live in that grace, then guess what? We can't help but to overflow with that grace in our service and our love for others. Only when we get the grace of God through Jesus will we experience the fulfillment and the joy and the purpose that God has for us in our serving. So as we close this morning, I just want to encourage you first and foremost, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe this time of response would be a time for you just to say, Lord, open my eyes. Am I serving with joy? Am I serving where you want me to serve? Am I open to serving whoever it is you want me to serve? And I would just encourage you, use this time as a a time to begin maybe a new conversation with the Lord that says, Lord, show me how, where, who I ought to be serving. And maybe you're caught up in a little bit of legalism and maybe you are living your Christian life as a quid pro quo Christian. Maybe you are continually putting the chunks of rocks on the scale. And maybe this morning, the invitation and the response is to take that scale and to kick it to the curb and to embrace the grace of Jesus. And that's a change of mind that will ultimately transform our actions and our attitudes. But I would say finally, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, please understand that this washing of your feet is symbolic and a reminder and a picture of the love that Jesus has for you that he humbled himself to die on the cross for you. He knew you could never stack that scale. He knew it. And so what did he do? He threw the scale to the curb. He went to the cross. He died. The Bible says he took your place. He took your sin. He died for you and took your punishment so that you could come to him, not by cleaning yourself up or trying harder or getting religious, but you could come to him by faith and accept the gift. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd encourage you to embrace and receive and place your faith in him. 
I'm going to be up front. Pastor Chip will be up front. If you're here and you're a believer and you just want to pray, maybe you just want to thank God for what he's doing in your life, we always invite you to come. We'll let you uh, please come forward and pray. If you're here and you'd like to talk to one of us about becoming a Christian, we'd love to do that. Whatever the Lord's laid on your heart, this time is open to you. This front is open if you want to pray. However the Lord's working in your life, we invite you to come. Father, we ask now that you would, you would flood us with the truth and just a greater glimpse of your grace and love for us and that we would leave this place overflowing with that grace and love. So whatever that looks like in each individual life, Lord, it, I just pray that you would work in our hearts. Help us to respond if it's uh, by coming forward, if it's just to respond in prayer or worship, whatever, Lord. We trust you. I trust what you're doing in our hearts. So I just pray that you would work and that we would respond. We love you. We give you this time, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.